Welcome to Mum Abroad's YouTube channel, where I'm joined today by Linda Brettel. Originally from the southeast of England, Linda served for over 20 years with the British Diplomatic Service with overseas postings in the Far East and Southeast Asia, India and Pakistan, the South Pacific, West Africa and Latin America. When she left, Linda settled in Spain with her husband to raise their two children and has since been heavily involved with the local expat community. Linda is now a life coach, mentor and personal counsellor and in 2020 she published her first book, Brains at the Border, about the psychological and emotional impact of expatriate life around the world. Hi Linda. Hi Jane, thank you for inviting me along. Thank you for joining me. Linda, let's go back to the beginning of your coaching journey. How did it all begin? Well, quite unexpectedly, really. When we first arrived in Spain, I opened a small language studio um, initially to teach English as a foreign language, TEFL. Um, and then there were so many new arrivals um, from the UK arriving in this area. I was soon asked to offer basic Spanish lessons um, in a format that people who'd never learned a foreign language um, could, could follow and understand. And from that, it turned into a newcomers club um, with advice surgeries and informal expat life coaching for people who were suddenly realizing that living abroad is not the same as a holiday. Um, and they, was, they were on such a, a, a steep learning curve. Um, so that's how I got involved. And I was um, hired on contract by an academy to offer self-development coaching for children and teenagers, mainly expatriate. It's, I've spoken to a lot of um, women over the past few months with these interviews um, who have their own business and I, they all have kind of organic growth, these businesses, and, and it just seems to be the perfect way, doesn't it, to grow yeah, a business? Absolutely, yeah. Experience-led. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, Linda, there are subtle differences between uh, life coaching and mentoring, and you do both. Can you explain what they are? Sure. Well, life coaching is all about sitting down with a client and identifying with them their, their aims, their goals, their aspirations, um, and creating an action plan to keep them on target, um, to identify any self-sabotage or challenges that they need to overcome. Um, and that carries on over a number of, uh, of set sessions. Um, <clears throat> men mentoring is more of a transfer of knowledge from a more experienced person to someone who is a newbie. Um, so for example, when I first went into counseling, I had a mentor who was an experienced relate counselor and a published author, and she'd had goodness knows how many clients. So she was there for me to turn to. Um, so the same in the work environment. If you've got a, a, a brand new graduate going into an executive position, they very often have a mentor above them to, to help them with their, with their aims and objectives as well. Linda, you work mainly with expats. Why do you think that you work particularly well with people living away from their home country? Okay, well, um, I've been there, seen it, and, and got the T-shirt, so to speak. I started my overseas life um, when I was quite an insecure 20-year-old girl when I first went to Japan. Um, and then I've experienced life overseas as a married woman, going up the career ladder, um, and then as a wife and mother, and we were juggling dual careers. Um, and uh, once we moved to Spain, we were very much under our own steam. Obviously, I used to have the support of the Foreign Office. My husband had had the support of the oil industry companies that he'd worked for. But we were very much left to our own devices here. And that, for us, was a challenge. And we knew it would take us some time to adapt. Um, the question was, oh, who does that? Oh, we do. <laughs> yeah, so it was very different. It was very different. But I, I do empathise with situations people find them in, you know, having had a bereavement, someone back home has died. Um, we had quite a challenge finding um, SEN support for our dyslexic son, for example. So lots of situations I, I, I totally empathise with. What would you say are the, um, are the challenges which cause the biggest overwhelm for people when they're relocating? Um, well, high up there, I think, can be a language barrier if you don't speak the local language, um, and isolation, cultural um, differences. Um, but I think the American author, Bill Bryson, said it beautifully in one of his travel writing um, books, 
when he said, you know, going going abroad to a new country for the first time, you suddenly feel five years old again. Um, you can barely understand anything, barely read anything. Um, you've only got a rudimentary grasp of the way systems work. Um, and it's all a, a series of interesting guesses for quite some time until you acclimatise. And I think for some people, being out of their comfort zone in that way is, is terrifying. I actually love it and I find it thrilling because it means I'm learning something new and, and growing. Um, but for other people, it can be it can be quite disconcerting. I think it's really important that people do as much homework as possible before they actually move yeah. abroad. Would you agree with that? Totally. Um, and in the information age, um, you know, ignorance is, is a choice, really. There's so much out there. Um, but it always amazed me how ill prepared a lot of people were moving overseas on their own for the first time. You know? Yeah. And you really don't have any excuse, do you, with kind of social media, with with Facebook and and, and groups of people, you can quite yeah. easily find um, groups yeah. of people living in, in yeah. particular areas and you can start asking questions there before you actually relocate, yeah. Absolutely, and even websites like yourselves, um, foreign office websites, um, British embassies, for example, um, in all countries have, have great travel advice and advice on living in a particular country. It's all out there, but you've, you need to do your own research um, because everyone is different as to their, their wants and needs and requirements. So. For several years, you were president of the national mental health charity Samaritans in Spain. How has that experience influenced your work as a coach, Linda? Um, well, the, the training with Samaritans in the Samaritans system definitely helped deepen my listening skills. Um, and I think everyone, if they have the opportunity, should take a, a course in listening skills um, just for their personal and, and work environments. And it also opened my eyes to the wider and deeper problems that are out in the community in general, whether at home or abroad, in the different um, ways of, uh, of traumas and, and despair that people go through. And so working with a charity like that, where you can offer a free helpline and lifeline to people who are desperate um, was amazing. And working with the volunteers and training and, and mentoring volunteers um, also gave me an insight into what motivates people um, into doing that sort of work, and particularly when it's unpaid. I know that the Samaritans are very active in Spain and, and a lot of people um, have found them incredibly helpful. What's the best way to contact them, Linda? Okay, well, there is a, a free phone helpline, which is open from 10 in the morning until 10 at night. Um, and you can, as I say, call free. The Samaritans pay for all the calls. It's not for the distressed person to pay. And it's open to any English speaker of any nationality um, and of any age, wherever they are in Spain. It's Spain, Spain wide and in the in Spanish islands. Um, and the telephone number is 900 525 100 which is quite easy to remember. Um, or, you can, or people can email to pat, P-A-T, at samaritansinspain.com, um, which is the website, samaritansinspain.com, with lots of information there. Um, also, if people are interested in volunteering, there are teams not only on the Costa Blanca, but so Costa del Sol uh, in Madrid, Barcelona, um, and the charity is always setting up new teams around the country. Um, so uh, it's a very worthwhile organisation. Um, you have life coaching, counselling and social care certifications mm -hmm. and you're also a Reiki practitioner and you also um, are an energy healer and work with something called emotion code and body code techniques. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what they are exactly? Sure. Well, Reiki is um, an energy healing system which involves channeling um, natural life force energy um, and um, administering that to the client just by means of, of gentle touch, um, which gives them a lot of uh, peace and calm and helps the body to have the right conditions to heal itself. Um, the body code and the emotion code are slightly different in that um, they are an energy healing technique but um, they can also be done over the internet. You don't have to physically touch the person. Um, and it is, it is um, a system that was devised by um, Dr. Bradley Nelson, who was a holistic 
um, doctor and chiropractor in the United States, and he's now got trained practitioners all over the world. Um, and the way it works is the practitioner asks questions of the client's subconscious by means of simple muscle testing. Um, and over the internet, the practitioner works as a proxy, so we test on ourselves. Um, so the client just has to sit there. It's not talk therapy. Um, but what happens is um, we decode hidden emotional baggage, trapped negative emotion, um, that very often, because it's subconscious, the client has no idea that this is what's causing them or part, potentially causing them any, any harm or any damage. Um, and by decoding what it is, um, it can be released because the body is electromagnetic, can be released by swiping healing magnets um, along this, what is used in the Chinese medicine as the central meridian line um, and diffusing that energy, releasing it. Um, and that means that that energy is gone permanently. Um, so one of the benefits for people who don't like talk therapy is that let's say an, an emotion is identified of grief, age 15. OK, you would ask, do you do you recognize that? Um, and the client would say yes. If they don't want to talk about it, they don't have to necessarily. All we need to do is release it. Um, so it saves them. People often um, are reluctant to go into counseling or therapy because they don't want to relieve that event. But this is very quick. And once it's gone, um, hopefully it's gone. And with that's obviously releasing a trapped emotion, but the body code goes even deeper as well into looking for toxins within the body, lifestyle and nutrition needs, um, even physical misalignments with the skeleton, organs and glands, immune system, um, because the subconscious mind runs all of our bodily functions from temperature to breathing, heart rate, um, and it knows what's going on. So if uh, anything's unhappy and unbalanced in the body, it will tell you if you ask it the right questions. So you can treat most things with this emotion and body code technique as long as people are open to trying it, presumably. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't replace medicine and it's not a okay. therapy as such, but what it does... It's, it works on the premise that the human body has all it needs to heal itself. When you cut your finger, it heals naturally. Um, but because of all the stresses and strains and traumas that we go through, our whole system, mind and body, gets imbalanced in many ways. And it may only show up years later. Um, and very often that is the cause of dis-ease, disease in the body. Um, and the idea is that by releasing all that negative energy and realigning the body, it creates the conditions whereby the body can naturally heal itself. So whether you've got um, digestive issues, fibromyalgia, migraine, cancer even, um, you know, it can't guarantee to re relieve you of the cancer. But what it can do is help the body be in its best possible state for, for that healing to occur alongside conventional medicine. So I'd just like to talk a little bit about your book, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I found a quote on your website that says, in an attempt to regain some work-life balance, Linda leaves the diplomatic service and settles with her family on Spain's Costa Blanca. This is where the jaw-dropping fun really begins with the arrival of hordes of ill-prepared Brits expecting to live the dream, having left their brains at the border. It's a great title for a book. Um, you. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about it and maybe give us some anecdotes. Yeah, sure. Um, um, by no means, it's not trying to trivialize or make fun of people's situations. Um, we were just a bit stunned that people hadn't done as much research as you might have thought when going to move overseas um, for the first time. So because of the things that we were involved in with the language studio and newcomers club and advice surgeries and things like that, and as I said, getting into, into the coaching that way, um, because we could speak Spanish and we were experienced, um, uh, then we, we tended to be the go-to people after a while for all the new arrivals in our area. Um, and we found um, that many, unfortunately, had been taken for a ride, either by a, a lawyer or a real estate agent, an interpreter, um, or all of those. Um, and in one, one sad case, um, one gentleman, you know, who'd been a company director, um, had got himself into a real situation with um, a purchase of land and erecting um, a log cabin. Uh, and in an altercation where it all came to a head, uh, when he realized he'd been rather duped into parting with all his cash and things weren't as they seem, ended up in a, you know, an iron bar 
over his head and, you know, him going to A&E, um, which was very unfortunate because had he, had he really, pe people see what they want to see, I think, and didn't really look at what lay, lie beneath that. So it could maybe have been avoided. Um, I had another lady who um, uh, stars in her eyes, I think, a little bit, had come, couldn't speak Spanish, um, wanted to work as a midnight, with, as a midwife um, in a Spanish hospital. Um, but she hadn't had a, hadn't thought to investigate whether she needed to have her qualifications transferred um, and so on and so forth. So a lot of those people sadly ended up either not doing what they wanted to and working for very little money in a bar restaurant, an expat bar restaurant, which is where the only way they could find work, or going back to the UK um, rather disappointed, which was a real shame. Um, another occasion I had um, a mum send her two teenage children to me for Spanish lessons. And with the best will in the world, there was no way with um, starting with them from scratch that I could get them up to coping with a Spanish high school curriculum within weeks, which is what she thought might happen, and was complaining that the local state high school didn't offer GCSEs in, in English like they do in the UK. Um, so, <laughs> um, on the one, it, it, you know, we, we were just bewildered by it all, really, because obviously our experience had been, especially working for organisations, that there was always a, a welfare officer and someone at post to to help you and guide you. But of course, they were they'd seen um, a, an idyllic location as they thought when they were on holiday, and oh well, other people are doing it, we should as well, but without really going into the pros and cons of what they were doing. And it's really just a highlight for other people who may be out there and thinking, I don't know, maybe not Spain so much now, but other places like Croatia or further afield. It's you have to do your research for your own particular circumstances. Yeah, I think we, we just need to reiterate that, don't we? If you if you relocate um, with already with a job with a, in a big corporation with a big company, you're probably going to be looked after and not have any issues. Mm -hmm. um, but if you relocate by yourself and you don't have a job or, you know, you think that you're going to get a job when you arrive in that country, mm -hmm. then you really need to do your homework before yeah. you leave. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And particularly with the job market as it is at the moment, um, you know, young people in their 20s here can often speak four or five language fluently, languages fluently, but end up working in retail, you know, because that is the situation for, for work. So I, I find it quite sad and amusing at the same time when people post on Facebook, oh, I'm thinking of coming out, what are the chances of getting a job? Um, pretty slim, really, pretty slim, yeah. Well, really interesting to talk to you today, Linda. Um, Welcome. Fascinating to hear about your book and the, the stories, but also really interesting to hear about your mentoring and coaching business that you have. So if anybody would like to find more information about that, they can take a look at your website, which is their expatmentors.com. They'll find out more about the services that you offer and they'll also find your contact details. So that just leads me to say thank you very much for joining me, Linda. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. <laughs>